Hi, so welcome back. So in this video, I'm going to talk about something that a lot of my students have asked me. They say, you know, okay, fine, you know, you've answered my question in the other video about, you know, what happens during a PhD program, but then what actually happens once you become a faculty member? What are the things that you are engaged in doing? Well, I'm going to talk about five things that faculty members actually do. And of course, there are many exceptions based on institutions, universities, etc. But I'm speaking maybe more from personal experience. So the one thing that everybody thinks about, that's the easy one, is teaching, right? Um, you spend a certain number of hours per week in front of students, more or less performing. Um, depends on where you go, you know, teaching hours are different at different institutions. In the US, we talk about teaching loads in terms of a number slash another number. So let me explain. Um, you might be at an institution where you have what is called a 4-4 load, as in 4 slash 4. A 4-4 load means you teach four classes per semester. Some people may also say I teach a 3-3 load, as in three classes per semester. If you're on the quarter system, it might be something like I have a 3-3-3 load, in other words, three classes per quarter. Uh, I know some places make their faculty teach during the summer as well, and so they might have something like a 3-3-2 load. In other words, three classes during the semesters, two classes during the summer. But you teach a certain number of hours. In the U.S., courses you know, vary in length. Um, I they normally tend to be somewhere in the 40 hours, 45 hours. Uh, when I taught in France, a course was uh, 30 hours each. Um, and I noticed in France that courses didn't exactly start and end on regularized semesters so people would make references to things like I teach you know 90 hours a year 180 hours a year and that would be the number of classes that uh, they taught they didn't speak in terms of 2-2 but that's a big part of your job I mean it's something you have to do every week although it's certainly the, the the least of your time constraints right so you're going to be actually in front of students performing teaching now along with teaching there's also all the other stuff that goes along with the actual showing up and teaching. So there's a lot of prep work, if, especially as a beginning academic. You're going to be doing brand new courses that you've probably never taught before. So when I was in graduate school, my doctor is in entrepreneurship, but I always taught strategy because that's what my advisor needed me to teach. I never taught entrepreneurship. And I was actually hired to teach business ethics in my first job, which I didn't do any research at all or have any teaching experience in that field. So. First thing I had to do was read the textbook, read all the materials that the publishers give you. So fortunately, if you're an academic and you're prepping a class, you can ask the publisher for some help and they'll give you, some, some, some publishers will give you slide decks, some will give you like your tests and your exams ahead of time with answer keys. You know, there's, um, and sometimes they'll give you shells for your learning management system. There's different things that publishers can give you uh, to make teaching easier. Uh, but nonetheless, you're going to have to read the textbook, you're going to have to learn the material, and then you've got to probably prep your slides because what the publishers normally give you is not that great. And you've got to, you know, so basically make up your own slides, you've got to rehearse a bunch. And so, you know, I think for a beginning academic, you can count on the fact before the class, for every, you know, hour that you're in class, you probably have about three hours of prep work before that. Right. It, you know, after you've taught the same class a few times, you don't really have to prep as much. But at least in the beginning uh, years of being an academic, yeah, it's about three hours. And then there's the stuff that happens after class, right? You've got a great homework. You've got a great assignment. You've got two great exams. I mean, those are all things that have to be done. Um, additionally, you've got to be in office hours. I know most schools, it's probably like for every hour you're in class, you probably have to have one office hour per week, give or take. And of course, students may want to come see you and they want to make an appointment and you, you, know, you may choose to go in and, and talk to them or not. But you, know, you figure if you're teaching, I don't know, 12 hours a week, especially as a beginning academic, yeah, you're going to be spending your first semester doing an awful lot of prep and an awful lot of stuff afterwards, right? And that's kind of invisible work, um, but you still got to do it. Now the other thing that academics do, um, you know, I guess number number two is there's always a lot of administration to do. Um, in most universities, faculty are the ones running that university. So you'll be on committees where you discuss, you know, the strategy of the university in the future, or you know, space and place committee. My previous job was 
one where they decided how the facilities on campus should be used. So there's a lot of actually running the university, determining what's acceptable curriculum or not, uh, determining, you know, number of hours that faculty have to teach. Sometimes you can get on compensation committees. So, you know, the bigger the university, the more committees there are. And you can, you can easily get sucked into doing a lot of administrative stuff. I mean, it can really eat up all of your time. So that's another thing that uh, you can get stuck doing at a university is doing a lot of administration. But the one you need to pay the most attention to is your research, right? Research at the end of the day, ir irrespective of what people tell you, research is still fundamentally the currency of the academic profession. So every moment that you have, you, you've got to do your research, right? And that means reading tons and tons of articles, making commentaries for you know, your own personal notes on those articles. And then, of course, sitting down and writing your own papers, sending them off to journals, knowing that they're probably going to be rejected, revising articles that you've sent to journals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there's a lot of work uh, with research. Um, I try to spend about 30 to 35 hours a week on research, and then I try to allocate the rest of my time to administration, teaching, and things like that. Um, which means it's a seven-day work week for me. So research, research, research. Um, administration, you know, you've got to do it, but it's not going to get you promoted. Good or bad teaching, it's probably not going to impact your career that much. Research or a lack of it, though, will define your career. So that's the thing you, you want to focus the most on. Um, like summers, they always talk about summers off or Christmas break off. No. Summers off means I'm not teaching and I'm not doing administrative stuff, so that way I can dedicate all of my time to research. Uh, that's what that means. Now I can choose to go home or go somewhere else besides the university and do my, do my research. That's fine. But I'm still having to do it. And then the final thing, that, which is really the highlight of the academic profession, is that you get to go to conferences. You, know, you, you submit a paper to a conference, hopefully you get accepted and you get to go and you present your research. You meet new people or maybe you have friends that you only see every year at conferences. So that's pretty rewarding. That's something that I really enjoy. You, know, you get kind of like, oh, by the end of the year, you're tired. You go to a conference, you see all your friends and you get rejuvenated and kind of a recharge. That's, that's nice. That's something that I really enjoy. Of course, conferences are normally in fun, exotic locations. I, I'm lucky I, I get to go to Europe for conferences or something like that if I, as long as I get accepted or go to somewhere new and you know, eat food and talk to people. It's not bad. It's not a vacation. I mean, conferences are very physically demanding. You start sometimes 8 in the morning in my field, and you, I usually go till you know, the conference itself usually goes to six and you've got networking events at night. So it's, it's like an 8 to 10 thing, and most conferences are only three or four days precisely because of the fact physically you just can't go anymore by the end. But that's what happens at conferences. If you have any questions or would like to know more, post it in the comments. Uh, make sure you subscribe if you haven't subscribed to my channel. I always uh, appreciate my YouTube community, and I'll see you next time.